Hello, everyone, and welcome to Writing for Your Life. This is the author platform development through social media webinar series. Um, thank you for joining us. My name is Brian Elaine, and I produce the Writing for Your Life conferences. Um, it's my pleasure this evening to have Rachel Held Evans as our speaker, uh, my very good friend who is going to be presenting How to Turn Hate Mail into Origami, Engaging Your Readers in the Internet Age. So, um, uh, Rachel needs no further introduction than that. I think uh, you all know who, who she is and all the great books she's written, so I'm not going to uh, belabor that. But um, if you would like to ask questions, uh, there's a chat box uh, there over at the side. You can type in the questions, and after Rachel's presentation, we will get to those. Um, so let's see. Let me get Rachel on here to be able to present to everyone. Hello, Rachel. Hey, everybody. How's it going? Oh, I can't hear you say. Great, back, but I believe it. I believe <laughs> I'm sure it. they're saying it. <laughs> uh, thanks so much for having me. Uh, it's a joy to be here again, and um, I enjoyed this format last time, and hope to uh, take advantage of it this time for some uh, some good thoughts on uh, engaging readers in the internet age. So um, I'll just take it away. Yes, go for it. Okay, <laughs> all right. And I, if it looks like I'm in a theater. It's because I am. I'm in our little home theater corner of the basement in my house because my husband's upstairs putting our one-year-old to bed. Uh, so if you hear screaming and crying and kicking and grinding of teeth, it's because Goodnight Moon is over and uh, <laughs> the dark time has become, begun at, as my little one-year-old thinks of it. So um, I'm exiled here in the basement and behind me though is a life-sized uh, cutout of Gandalf the White. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Um, he might make an appearance later. Uh, he's got maybe his sword. Time, maybe ready. next time we'll have Dan read a uh, story to Henry and we can share that with everyone. Oh, how precious would that be? Oh my goodness. Um, so anyway, if you, if you hear anything, just just ignore it. Just ignore it. Nothing going on here. But it's a pleasure to be here, and we're going to be talking about something that's, that's important to me and that I spend a lot of time thinking about, maybe too much time thinking about. Uh, and since this series is uh, focusing on developing a social media platform, I thought I'd share a little bit about what I've learned as far as engaging your readers uh, on social media platforms, um, how to stay in touch with your readers, uh, without it being a complete time suck, and how to respond to the feedback that you get, both positive and not so positive, uh, in a way that makes you a better writer, and uh, in a way uh, that makes you able to connect with your readers without letting them control you, uh, which is really the challenge. Because uh, this is a unique time to be a writer. Uh, it's never quite been like this. When Mark Twain wrote an article for The Atlantic or... Uh, published a book, he couldn't hop on Twitter and find out immediately what everybody thought about it. Uh, we're dealing with instant feedback uh, as writers in this day and age. Although I really wish Mark Twain was on Twitter. Like if he were here, I think he would actually flourish in that format. Few writers do, but he would. Um, but but we're in a, a completely different time in which the feedback is instant and sometimes intense. Uh, and uh, and that can affect how we think about ourselves as writers. It can affect how we write. It can affect what our books are like, not just what our Facebook statuses are like. Um, so uh, on the one hand, we have the opportunity to understand and connect with our readers like no writers have ever been able to do before, to really get our fingers on the pulse of how they're thinking and what they believe, and, and to understand our audience in a really uh, impactful way, um, but we also face the challenge of being paralyzed by um, criticism, paralyzed by fear of what people think, uh, paralyzed by all that instant feedback. So uh, regardless, I remain convinced that there's no better place than online to cultivate an enthusiastic and an engaged readership, uh, and it's so critical that we learn to do this well, because uh, we have an amazing tool on our hands to connect with our readers. So let's definitely take advantage. Um, so I'm gonna share a little bit of what I've learned along the way, but think of me less of a teach as less of a teacher and more of a student because this is uh, a whole new age and we're all taking this a day at a time and we're all learning from mistakes and trial and error. So I'll tell you what I can see from this point of view. Um, and I look forward to your feedback 
uh, both in this format and um, in others to come. So I'm going to switch over to PowerPoint. So I've titled this talk, uh, How to Turn Your Hate Mail into Origami. And uh, I'll show you some actual origami in a little bit. Um, uh, so Brian offered a lovely introduction just now. But um, if the internet had anything to say about it, it would have turned out a bit differently. These are actual quotes from people on the internet about me. Um, one of my favorites is, uh, Rachel Held Evans is a deceived woman and false teacher in the church. She is a dangerous combination of an excellent writer with a lot of bad theology and a very big audience. See, my takeaway there is that this person thinks I'm an excellent writer, so that's cool. I choose not to read her blog because it simply tempts me to all manner of sinful anger. Um, and there's a comment about me being a heretic. That's pretty common and about how God needs to send a man to me to, you know, set me straight. And then I love this one here. Rachel Held Evans is an embarrassment to the church, a whiner and a publicity whore. Still, always looking on the bright side, this guy. Still, she seems to believe enough of the gospel not to be entirely apostate. She's got a lot of problems, but I'd stop short of calling her demonic. So I'm going to start putting that as like the blurb on the back of my books. Rachel Held Evans, not entirely apostate and probably not a demon. Uh, so as you can see, I get my fair share of criticism. Uh, not all of it is so silly. Uh, some of it's a lot more hurtful, actually, and, and I take it a lot more personally. Sometimes um, it rolls right off my back. Um, and sometimes, especially if you're a woman writing online, you know that it can get actually kind of scary. Uh, women on social media, women writing online face uh, threats and slurs um, that can get pretty intense at times. So I'll only say a few words about that. But um, this is on the on the mild side, we'll say that. Uh, but at the same time, I also receive incredibly positive, encouraging, affirming um motivating feedback from readers. Uh, these are just a few of the comments that were left on the last blog post I wrote um, just a week ago. I wrote about having a baby in 2016 and how it was uh, such a tumultuous year for our culture, but how personally it was such a transformative event to have a child and how I was trying to make sense of those two things together. And, you know, the comments here, people talk about being in tears and you have, I have a comment from a woman who just had her third baby right when I had my first, a woman whose mother died in 2016. And so she shared about how this post impacted her. Um, uh, somebody who was questioning their calling as a spiritual director who felt some encouragement from the post that I wrote. And so you have all those crazy mean comments on the one hand, but then you have things like this that remind you of why you do what you do, uh, why you're a writer in the first place. Uh, you write to feel less alone. And these folks made me feel a little less alone last week and reminded me of why I do this. Um, so that that's that's encouraging. Uh, and to give you a sense like of the volume, you know, this post that I wrote had it only had like 70 comments on my blog, but it had more than 200 comments on Facebook. Um, and then, of course, there were like 20,000 Facebook shares. And I have 105,000 Twitter followers uh, that I sent it out to. And I'm not saying all this to brag. I'm saying that the volume of responses can be pretty intense, especially when people are sharing their, their heart and soul. And that was actually kind of a, a, a low share week for me. So it's, um, if I write something politically or theologically sensitive, I might get a lot more responses than that. So if you don't have a strategy for uh, responding to feedback, set in place before you get a lot of it, you're sunk <laughs> because it's, it's, it gets really hard to manage. Uh, and so I had some mistakes I made at the beginning and that I think I've made some corrections on and I'm going to share a little bit of that. So uh, first, to begin, a few just general do's and don'ts when it comes to engaging uh, people on social media, engaging your readers. Uh, first of all, do carve out time to respond to constructive reader responses. Not necessarily positive, but constructive. Um, if you remain aloof and inaccessible, that is not the way to build a platform online. No one expects you to respond to every single message, but if you remove yourself from the dialogue entirely, it sends the message that you're not interested in what your readers have to say. 
And the act of putting your writing online is an invitation for feedback. That is the nature of the medium. Readers really don't appreciate somebody who writes and runs. So I'm a big advocate for leaving your comments on, on a blog post. Just do it. Like if, if you're going to be a blogger, you need to have comments. Uh, that's just kind of the nature of the medium. Other online platforms, maybe not as much. But, um, but when you write online, you're inviting feedback. So expect it. Um, but that said, it's important not to let a busy comment section or Facebook response completely hijack your writing day, which I let happen all the time. Because I consider spending an hour arguing with somebody on Twitter just part of platform building, right? <laughs> no, that's not, not the case. So um, I found that it helps if you just set aside a specific amount of time, maybe 30 minutes to an hour a day after you post something major online, like a blog post or an article uh, to respond to all the comments at once. Just make that your, your task for a few minutes. Um, and you can keep it short. You don't have to write long, thoughtful responses to every long, thoughtful comment. Uh, readers are usually just happy to be acknowledged uh, and to know that they were heard, even if it's just a little like that you give them, a little like button. Uh, so I save my lengthiest uh, responses for the people who have been most vulnerable with me. So like the, the woman who shared about her mother dying in 2016. I'm going to spend a little more time responding to that than I am going to another comment. Um, because at the end of the day, readers who feel heard will come back, even if you don't engage in every comment every single time. Uh, there's no better place online, like I said before, to cultivate an enthusiastic and engaged readership. So treating your readers with respect and with warmth is the best way by far to win their loyalty. So carve out time to respond. Don't write and run. Uh, second, learn from reader feedback and let it shape your writing. Um, it's just, it's such a privilege and such a gift as a writer to be able to be this in touch with our readers. Because you know when you're writing a book uh, or an article or whatever it may be, it's so important that you understand your audience. Your editor will be pushing this and pushing this. Who are you writing this for? And because of my work online, I always know exactly who my audience is. I know what they like. I know what they don't like. I know what they think is funny. I know what they think is annoying. I feel like I get my readers. And it's thanks to the fact that I've engaged their comments uh, uh, online. And quite a bit of the content of Searching for Sunday, uh, my latest book, was shaped by reader input. Um, after engaging my readers over the years, I saw that one of the biggest questions on their mind was, what do I do about church when my faith is in a state of flux? Uh, is there a community of faith for people like me who doubt? Uh, when do I stay in a church? When do I leave? Um, how do I deal with feeling isolated among the people who are supposed to know and love me the best? They had all these questions about what does it mean to be part of a church and the church uh, in this day and age? And so, uh, Searching for Sunday gave me the chance to respond to that with my own story, uh, telling my own story, and also incorporating the stories of some of my readers. Uh, I quoted from several of my readers in the comment section uh, in Searching for Sunday. I got permission from each of them to do that. I contacted them ahead of time about that. But um, they, more than any other book, uh, my readers shaped the content of Searching for Sunday because I was paying attention to what they were telling me and was yielded to that. So. And as a result, it was my most successful book sales-wise, and it was my, it's been my favorite one that I've written. So, and I think it's because more than any other book, I knew exactly what my audience was interested in. Um, so listen to your audience and let it impact how you write uh, and I, what you, how you view the world. It certainly has for me. It's opened up, opened my eyes to the stories and experiences of other people in a way that um, I never, ever could have anticipated. So. My readers have changed me as a person and they've changed me as a writer. I'm super grateful for that. Uh, be, be open to that. Be open to that growth. Um, third, apologize, uh, retract, and correct when appropriate. I have an entire blog category uh, devoted to apologies <laughs> because I've had to do them so often. I started blogging in 2008. I was in my early 20s. So really, I... Um, or my late 20s. When was 2008? Well, we were all young and naive and happy. Anyway, that, that was a long time ago. So I've had a lot of apologies and uh, mistakes that I've needed to make. Um, 
Uh, I like to use the blog to explore new ideas and to respond to what's happening in the culture. And so sometimes I just, I overstate my case or I speak from a place of ignorance or, um, and a commenter somewhere corrects me on it. And of course my first impulse, like everybody else is to be defensive. Uh, but when you're wrong, you're wrong. Uh, so if, if and if readers will respect you if you can admit when you're wrong, it shows them that you don't think you're above them. Uh, and when you apologize, whether it's in a comment or in a separate blog post or however you choose to do it, make it like a legit apology. Don't do the whole like, I'm sorry if people were offended. Be specific about what you did wrong. I apologize for painting with such a broad brush or I apologize for misrepresenting so-and-so's position or I apologize for not doing my homework and using the right terminology for something that's important. Um, if you say I apologize if you were offended, it puts the responsibility back on the reader and it's not a sincere apology. Um, and in my experience, if a post or a sentence or uh, a tweet or a Facebook status is widely critiqued, it's typically because I was wrong and not because everybody just misunderstood me. So I have a, a readership that's, that's genuinely or generally pretty interested in, in what I have to say and open to what I have to say and they want me to be right. So if all of a sudden they're all telling me I'm wrong, ah, chances are they're right. So. Um, uh, letting your readers hold you accountable builds trust with them. Uh, and so even if it's just a quick comment, oh, you know what, I didn't realize you're right, I'm wrong, that goes such a long way because you've taken yourself from the position of I'm the authority figure who knows everything to, hey, we're in this together and I respect what you have to say. Uh, and sometimes people will come up to me after an event and say, you know what really meant a lot to me was that apology you made the other day. And I'm thinking, oh, that's nice that I am remembered for a screw up. But what they what they're telling me is it meant a lot to them that I took their critique seriously and it meant a lot to them that I was um, truthful about my own mistakes. So uh, the great thing about writing online is if you do it right is you get the chance to temper your original response to criticism. So you get a chance to take a breath, see what you think is useful, and then respond when you do it right. Like I said, that doesn't always happen with me. The next point is to delete, ban, and block away. Do not ask yourself who would Jesus block. Just block people. <laughs> Contrary to what you may have heard, deleting someone's comment on your blog or blocking them on Twitter does not infringe upon their freedom of speech. Uh, freedom of speech protects you from getting thrown in jail for insulting the government not from the consequences of being a jerk online. So uh, you are the host of your online space. That's an important responsibility you have. And as such, you are responsible for making it a relatively safe environment for your other guests. Um, and I say relatively because uh, no place online is completely safe. So don't fool yourself into thinking that. But you, you want to create an environment in the comment section or on your Facebook page or any social media page that you manage that is overall constructive and positive. Um, so if someone comes along and they leave a comment that's totally off topic or that's super offensive, um, if, uh, delete it. Uh, and if they do it often, ban them or block them. You can find out how to do that uh, in your comment section and on Facebook. Um, and I do this all the time and I never feel guilty about it. I just don't because my first responsibility is to my other readers who have come there in good faith uh, to engage in a conversation. Um, and so my comment policy often gets, uh, people often notice this comment policy. In fact, I'm, I'm often complimented on it, but the truth is my husband wrote it. Um, and it is, please stay positive with your comments. If your comment is rude, it gets deleted. If it is critical, please make it constructive. If you are constantly negative or a general ass troll or hater, you will get banned. The definition of terms is left solely up to us. I should mention my husband's from New Jersey, and that's like the most New Jersey comment policy ever. So uh, that's that's how he sees it, and I, and I agree. Uh, you you define uh, what kind of space you want to have, and you have every right to to maintain it. Nobody's freedom of speech has been infringed upon if you delete a troll. So, um, which brings me to my don'ts list, and this is the number one rule of all online engagement. We all know it to be true and yet we all struggle to follow it. Don't feed the trolls. Uh, this has been true for all of time. This has been true from the beginning of the internet. And I want to be clear here. 
a troll is not a critic. There's a difference between a troll and a critic. A troll is someone, usually an anonymous someone, whose whole purpose is to get a reaction from you and your readers. Uh, and they'll do this by using slurs, by making wild or hateful claims, uh, by sending disturbing images or posting conspiracy theories, or often, in my case, Bible verses in all caps, uh, completely derailing the conversation and bringing out the very worst in everybody. Uh, that's their aim. Their goal is to get a reaction, not to contribute, not even really to argue. Um, so the very best thing to do with trolls is to just simply ignore them. Don't feed them. Uh, the mute button on Twitter is a glorious invention for this because then they don't even get the satisfaction of knowing that you've blocked them. Uh, they just think you're not paying attention when you're not just simply not getting any uh, words from them. Um, I usually just ignore the trolls when they find me on Facebook or Twitter, but if they show up on the blog uh, or on an online space that I manage, I usually just delete the comment before any of my readers take the bait. Um, sometimes I was like, oh, we'll just all, let's all ignore the trolls, but people aren't always on board with that, so sometimes they take the bait. I recommend just getting that comment gone as soon as you see it, because um, it's just too tempting sometimes. People often take the bait. Um, next, the next don't that I have is don't get lost in your brand. And, and here we're going to do some real talk, y'all. Um, <laughs> and here I might contradict everything another speaker has already told you, uh, in which case, um, I don't know, tweet me and tell me who you think was right. But <laughs> a lot gets said these days about writers cultivating an online brand, uh, which means, you know, sticking to certain subjects, developing a consistent voice, using their primarily their platform primarily to grow their email list and their following, and that's not a bad idea at all. But I think we can all see when a writer takes it a little bit too far. Um, it's kind of like that scene in A Christmas Story when the kid gets that orphan Annie decoder ring, and he's like so excited about the secret message it's going to tell him, but then when he decodes it, the message is, don't forget to drink your Ovaltine. <laughs> and he's like, what? A crummy commercial. And I feel like sometimes when I'm going to a writer's Facebook page or their Twitter page um, or their blog, and I'm looking to find out what their perspective is on world events or um, you know, just their view of the world and life, and it just feels like a crummy commercial because they're always kind of peddling their next product. Uh, and they just don't seem to be speaking from the heart. They seem a little more interested in managing their brand. Um, and I think sometimes writers get so concerned about avoiding controversy in order not to tarnish their brand that they end up kind of ironically making themselves irrelevant. Um, if everybody's talking about a certain issue, like there's a lot of issues that everybody's talking about right now, and they're just going on about like their ebooks on Christian time management or whatever it is, like nothing's happened, people notice <laughs> that they're kind of oblivious. Uh, and so in, in, in an odd way, it kind of, it kind of makes them irrelevant. So again, other speakers might disagree with me on this, but um, but here's the thing. I have never regretted losing a few readers because I spoke out about something I really believed was right. Um, and particularly at this moment in our culture, staying above the fray just isn't always an option. Sometimes you, you have to get in there and, and speak the truth in love. Um, and so cultivate a brand, sure, absolutely. Develop a consistent, marketable voice, but don't lose yourself in it. Uh, your brand should be a reflection of you and what you care about. So if it takes you outside of your expectations or your boundaries, uh, maybe to a political or theological issues that might be a bit thorny, just go there. If that's where your heart's taking you, go there and share that with your readers. Um, and, and the readers that matter will follow you uh, as long as you tell them the truth. Your number one job as a writer is to tell the truth. And so if the truth takes you uh, to an uncomfortable place, tell it anyway. Don't get so caught up in worrying about your brand that you don't speak when you feel it's time to speak. Um, so truth and vulnerability is what builds trust and loyalty with your readers, not total agreement. That's not what they're looking for. And I've really appreciated uh, Father James Martin, who has done uh, an, one of these uh, uh, 
web series himself. Um, you know, he kind of was branded as the funny priest, and uh, which is great because he is funny. He writes about humor and spirituality, and he appeared on the Colbert Report. Um, but you know, lately he's been using his platform to uh, speak some really important and pressing truths into our culture about what the gospel says about caring for the poor and the alien and the sojourners among us. So he's moving a little bit off brand, if you will, but it's, it's making a big impact and it's certainly making me a more loyal reader of his. So he's somebody who's doing that. Well, I also think of Glennon Melton uh, does that really well being personal, but also speaking up when she feels conviction. And then Sarah Bessie, uh, if you Google her, she wrote a really great post the other day called um, going off brand where she talked about this very issue of, you know, she felt compelled to write about something that wasn't really in her quote unquote brand, the way that she typically writes, but she felt compelled to do it anyway. So she explained why that was. Um, and I thought that was a really helpful, helpful piece. So, so look her up. So thanks for that little um, trip down. I, that was some real talk for you about branding and, and kind of my perspective on it. And I'd like to hear your feedback on it and, and what you think, but don't get lost in your brand, develop it, but don't, don't lose yourself to it. And then third, uh, let online conversations, uh, don't let <laughs> online conversations hijack your writing time. I mentioned this earlier, um, but this is just, this is something I really tell myself all the time. I'll be in this, co this completely fruitless argument with people on Twitter and I'll tell myself, well, it's okay because I'm building my platform right now, but I'm not. That's not actually building a platform. Building a platform is actually producing content and engaging in feedback around that content, not, not endlessly arguing. So, so just, I have to be very practical about this or I completely get lost. Um, it's just such a massive time suck to be online and everybody struggles with this. So I'm not saying you should never argue with people on the internet. It happens to the best of us. I'm just saying do it after hours. Do not do it during your writing time, your, your creating time. Uh, and if you're like me, this means you need to set aside a specific place and a specific time to write every day and unplug from social media during that time. Um, work somewhere where there's not internet, maybe, or um, to you know, temporarily disable the internet on your phone or your computer. Sometimes it just works to log out of like Twitter and Facebook um, so that you have to go through the steps of logging back in. Um, you know, little things like that can make all the difference in whether or not you get sucked out of your writing time or whether you commit to it. Um, I had my wisdom teeth out last week and my husband was like, you really don't need to be tweeting or being on Facebook when you're this high on Vicodin. So uh, I logged you out of all your social media accounts and you can't get on until you remember your own password, which is a brilliant strategy. So I, I was great um, and, and I did not tweet anything I regretted. So just logging yourself out. So figure out what works for you, what actually keeps you off the internet, whether that's going away from, from it or, or you know, creating just some kind of obstacle logging in or whatnot and um, stick to it so that you protect your writing time. And don't tell yourself that you're platform building when you're just arguing with your uncle on Facebook. Um, and then don't, the other don't that I have is don't attempt to serve uh, as a counselor or writing coach or judge or jury. There are certain things that your comment section are just not for and that they are, it's inappropriate to be engaging your readers on. Um, and this is hard sometimes, especially a lot of times in my comment section or even on Facebook or Twitter or email, I have readers who are just pouring their hearts out to me and just spilling their guts and telling me about their, their best and worst of times. And, and it, it's a lot to carry if you try to carry it. Um, and so you have to, to figure out what works for you in the way of, um, being able to set it aside or, or regulate it so that, that you're not acting as a counselor. Um, I recommend, one thing that I do is that if I know a post is gonna be on a pretty intense topic, you know, I'll include you maybe the domestic violence hotline or suicide hotlines in the information, or here's, if you're struggling with this, here's how you can get help, or um, you know, here's how you can research counselors and therapists in your area. So, so if you go ahead and provide those resources ahead of time, uh, you're not having to try and act as a counselor or psychologist or whatever yourself. Um, <clears throat> and then, you know, sometimes I'll respond specifically to comments and say, you know what, 
here's what I think about this, but you really might benefit from talking to somebody else. Um, and other readers will also do that too. Comment sections can be kind of self-regulating in that sense. And sometimes a therapist will jump on and be like, hey, you need to go talk to a therapist about this. Or here's my perspective, but you need to sit down with somebody. So, um, you know, don't take that all on yourself, as tempting as it may be. Uh, you can't. You cannot do it. I have tried, and it is impossible. So I put in, in place some steps, like I took the, my email off my website um, so that my email wasn't inundated with that sort of thing. And that made a big difference in the, the volume of uh, messages I was getting. Um, and then I just typically don't respond to direct messages on Facebook um, or Twitter. I pretty much ignore those um, and tell my readers that that's just the case because I just can't handle the volume. So um, put some things in place as your platform grows. You'll have to adjust those. But it's not your job to counsel people. Um, people need in-person help from their churches or from counselors or from friends and family. There are some things that the internet just can't do. And really, truly coming alongside alongside somebody and helping them through a difficult time, I think that's that's an embodied practice that, that that people need to do in their own community. So, as much as we can connect online and, and make each other better and learn from one another and encourage one another, there are limits. And so, know that that's the reality. Also, a lot of people will try to like, you know, use you for try to get writing advice or you know pitch you an idea or here's my book proposal you know that's that's not really the space don't feel like you have to do any of that um and then also uh, there, there's a comment sections are not the place i should say this to report crimes or to litigate things that are best left in the courts so just know that there, there are some things that 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 really don't need to be happening in your comment section and if they begin to happen you need to shut it down <laughs> so um uh, just know that, that, that you're not responsible for the lives of the people behind those comments. Um, you're responsible for that space and what happens in that specific space. Uh, but you, you just can't take it all on yourself. So that's something I kind of have had to learn and I'm still trying to learn how to navigate. Um, so those are my do's and my don'ts. Um, but the, the question that I probably get asked the most uh, when talking about online engagement is how do I respond to criticism? Because um, people see how people respond to me online and, and, and people experience it themselves. And they want to know, um, you know, how, how do you deal with this? And because I'm not the only one who faces this kind of criticism. Um, uh, the reality is if you take any risks in life at all, if you write, if you teach, if you minister, preach, parent, advocate, if you speak up for what you think is right, if you do anything remotely interesting or constructive with your life, you will face criticism. It is uh, part of the deal. And in our highly connected information-based culture, criticisms are often swift, they're often public, and sometimes they're pretty cool. Um, and the truth is, I'm not great at responding to criticism. I never have been. I've always been since childhood, been somebody who takes criticism really personally and shrinks when even a suggestion that I'm doing something wrong is made. Um, so my first impulse when I'm criticized is to get defensive, um, to fight back or to curl up and cry or to let paralyze, to let criticism paralyze me creatively. And that's what we really want to try to avoid. Um, that's when criticism becomes a problem, not when it hurts us, not when it challenges us or changes us for the better, not when it simply rolls us off our back, but when it paralyzes us, when it keeps us from creating uh, and connecting and engaging the world with joy. So here, these are a few strategies that I've had for, um, for, for responding to, to criticism. I'm going to switch over to, to my face because <laughs> I want to see me for a minute. You see me? Okay. Um, I, I like to tell this story about uh, handling criticism. I, my, um, I had had a particularly difficult day on the internet one day, and I sat, I, I will never forget, I had been engaged in some kind of argument. I can't remember what it was, some kind of debate. Oh, and something was said about what right do you have 
uh, as a woman without a seminary education uh, to s speak and write about these topics, which hits on a real insecure little nerve in my heart. And uh, I'll never forget, I sat down on the couch in the living room and put my head in my hands, uh, and I was so angry. Um, and I sat up and I folded my arms and I said, you know, and I looked at Dan, my husband, and I said, you know what, Dan? If I'm going to make it in this industry, if I'm going to make it as a writer, I'm just going to have to grow thicker skin. I'm going to have to toughen up. I'm going to have to not let anything get to me. I'm going to have to be cold. I'm going to have to be hard. And I was giving myself this like pep talk, like I'm not going to let anything get to me anymore. And I'll never forget Dan turned to me and he said, Rachel, I'm so proud of you. You take on so much and you really are growing thicker skin. They said, but whatever you do, please don't ever lose your sweet and tender heart because that's part of what makes you Rachel. And that's one of the things I love best about you. So of course, then I was just like, <laughs> like you're just a puddle of tears. Snot was coming out of my nose. Uh, and I just had a big old cry because he's right. Um, we can't selectively numb ourselves. So if in an effort to protect ourselves from being hurt by criticism, uh, we close ourselves off, uh, we're also closing off the part of ourselves that can be moved by with compassion, that feels empathy, that hurts for other people, that rejoices with other people. And so I'm not willing to, uh, to shut down that part of me that can be hurt because it's important that that part of me stay functioning. Uh, if I'm going to be a follower of Jesus who cares about other people and cares about the world. Um, and so that became something of a mantra for me, thick skin, tender heart, um, grow the thick skin. Uh, if you're going to do, if you're going to be a writer, you have got to get used to rejection and criticism. It is occupational hazard. It is part of the job. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. So you've got to grow thick skin. You've got to take yourself a little less seriously. Uh, but whatever you do, don't compromise your tender heart. Keep your heart tender, uh, which means sometimes you just got to let it sting. You got to let it hurt. Um, and when it does, be encouraged because it means you're still a human being. <laughs> God forbid I ever get to the point where cr no criticism ever gets to me. Um, if, if you're feeling the pain, uh, it, it matters and it, it means your heart's still beating. So uh, when we lose our capacity to be vulnerable and to be hurt, uh, we lose our capacity to create. Um, so it's not worth it. Um, so sometimes you got to let it hurt. You got to let it sting. Thick skin, tender heart. Uh, I just like to share that story because Dan's been such an encouragement in that regard. Okay, I'm going to switch back to my PowerPoint. Um, so thick skin, tender heart is the first point. The second, um, and I kind of touched on this, is pay, pay attention to your pain. Uh, like I said, when uh, the people had made the criticism about me not going to seminary and how, you know, who are you to be talking about spirituality if you don't have you haven't been educated in that that way. Um, that one really hurt uh, because it's something I believe about myself. It's an insecurity I have. So criticism that hurts the most is criticism I believe to be true. So like if somebody says, Rachel, I think you're going to hell. I'm like, oh, well, probably not. But if they say, you know what, I feel like that last chapter was a little bit wordy and anticlimactic. I'm like, oh my gosh, you're right. It was. It was wordy and anticlimactic because it's the second part I'm actually more insecure about than the health stuff, uh, for better or worse. So in this regard, you're, what hurts you, the criticism that hurts you can be so instructive in your life. So pay attention and ask yourself, what part of me believes that this criticism is true? Uh, and is it because it is true? Like maybe this poison person is speaking a difficult truth into my life, like a truth I need to hear. Um, or is this person repeating a lie that I like to believe about myself? Like, who are you? Who do you think you are? A woman who hasn't been to seminary. Um, that's a lie that I like to believe about myself. So pay attention to the criticism that hurts because it will, it will instruct you, it will teach you about yourself um, as a person and as a creator. Um, it's an uh, opportunity to pay attention to your life um, and to your heart. So uh, listen to your pain. 
Uh, third, know and grow your roots. And what I mean by this is know your people, know the people that ground you in your life. Um, when you have a sort of job that generates a lot of feedback, it can be really easy to let the praise take you too high and the criticism take you too low. And that's why it's so important to ground your identity in something solid uh, and the people and the community and the practices um, that remind you of who you are. You know, know the people in your life who uh, are, you know, it's like they they are your biggest supporters, but they're not fans. <laughs> you know, my husband is my biggest supporter, but he's not a fan. <laughs> you know, he knows the real Rachel. Uh, my mom and my dad, my sister, um, my closest friends uh, know who those people are. And when you're wondering whether a criticism is true, ask them. They'll be straight with you. Uh, let those people ground you and keep the the praise from taking too, you too high and the criticism from taking you too low. Um, and it's important to know who these people are before you see any measure of success because people will pretend um, after that. So you know who they are. And then also know the, the spiritual practices that keep you rooted in reality. Um, I have a prayer that I like to pray um, from Teresa of Avila whenever I'm having a difficult <laughs> online engagement day. This is like my internet prayer from you know, hundreds of years ago. Let nothing upset you. Let nothing startle you. All things pass. Only God does not change. Patience wins all it seeks. Whoever has God lacks nothing. God alone is enough. Just repeating that. It slows me down when I'm feeling frazzled and um, criticized and misunderstood. It's, it's a way of kind of uh, sinking myself into a deeper and more important reality. Um, and that's just one of many prayers that I find helpful. So whatever your spiritual practice is, um, identify that and, and, and use it when you're facing intense criticism from readers or um, on the internet. Um, and then, of course, you can always disarm with kindness. It's amazing to me. People don't expect people to be nice on the Internet. So when you're kinder than expected, it can disarm all sorts of assaults. Um, uh, oh, and before that, though, engaging the positive. I want to make a quick point on this. Um, it's, it's just so easy to get. Uh, derailed and focused on the negative comments. If there's 200 comments and 199 of them are positive and one of them is negative, you will focus on the negative comment. It is just how we are built. Uh, and in fact, there is, there's a, a name for this. It's called negativity bias. Um, and it's, it refers to the tendency for the mind to react to bad things more quickly, strongly, and persistently than to equivalent good things. So in other words, even when of equal intensity, things of a more negative nature affect us more deeply than things of a more positive nature. And evolutionarily, this makes sense because it's more important for our ancestors to remember that putting your hand in a fire hurts than to remember that the sun on your back feels really nice. So if we have we have evolved to have this impulse to remember the negative more than the positive, but it'll mess with you because you think, wow, everybody hated that blog post when the reality is two out of 100 people didn't like it. Um, and it's really rude to the rest of your readers to focus on the one negative, actually. Um, it's like being at a party and everybody's hanging out and you're like, I'd like to spend the time, my time in this corner with this guy who thinks I'm a feminazi. That sounds like a good time. It's, it's kind of, it's like rude to the rest of your guests. So um, engage the positive and remember that uh, the negative comments seem bigger than they are. Um, and then, so just engage the positive, disarm with kindness, be kinder than people expect you to be. Um, that's the classic, we're Christian, you know, the third way practice of um, turn the other cheek and, um, if somebody asks you to walk a mile, walk with them too. The, 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 the notion behind that is not passivity or just acceptance. The notion behind that is um, a, the kind of kindness that disarms people, that surprises people. Um, so practice that. And then finally, before we go to questions, turn your hate mail into origami. And this is something I have actually done, uh, and I've got some of it here with me. Uh, one Lenten one year for Lent, I decided I wanted to focus on um, how God can take ugly things and make them beautiful again. Uh, and so I decided to print up some of the meanest things people have ever said about me from the internet and turn them into origami. 
uh, and it was really fun. Um, and I made some like blackout poems too, you can see there. Um, uh, so this is, I'll show you some of the things that I made. This is a little, it's a little fox that I made out of, um, that looks like a negative Amazon review <laughs> for one of my books. This is a little bird. He's seen better days. He got a little crumpled up. This was a couple years ago I made this. Uh, this is a little bird made out of a terrible Facebook comment. And this, this is a boat that I made out of, um, I print, oh no, this was out of a letter somebody sent me via my editor. It's like, it's, it's, it's only sometimes good news when you get a big pack from your, your editor of like fan mail, because <laughs> it's not all fan mail. So then there's mean stuff in there. So I made a boat out of it. And this is another little crouching fox um, that I made out of. Uh, that looks like maybe a Facebook comment. So that's where a lot of the negativity is. Um, and that's, this was just a way of acknowledging that God can take uh, the ugly things in our lives and, and redeem them and restore them into something beautiful. And um, it was also a way to contemplate the fact that, you know, when you say something to somebody, when you write something to somebody, those words can stick around for a long time. Um, and so, you know, just even looking up and seeing this little fox sitting on my tape, my dining room table for a couple of weeks as I was working on these was a reminder to me that the words that I say to other people might stick around longer in their lives than I realize. Um, and that maybe I should be careful and wiser uh, about that. So, so I hope all of that was helpful. Uh, I'd like to take a little bit of time for questions if there are any. Um, yeah. So Rachel, thank you so much, you know, for that. I think um, your ability to give a very uplifting and positive treatment of a topic that is obviously challenging and difficult and, and you've been through it all, um, you know, is really a, a great reflection on your authenticity and your maturity and your skill. So um, I think you're a wonderful role model for us all. Well, thanks. It's, I feel like it's being tested right now. Just things are so intense. On, like the internet is such a the loud place right now that it's, it's a really hard time to put this in practice. So um, I struggle as much as anybody else. So um, as I mentioned before, anyone that has questions, feel free to uh, type them into the chat box. Um, one of the things I'd like to ask you about, Rachel, is kind of stepping back in time. Um, you're <clears throat> one of the classic cases who built a really strong online following and then got a book deal. So maybe you can just talk briefly about that progression and what you would do differently if you were starting Ooh. at that point today. Yes. Um, this is important, I think. Um, and what I started to do wrong, but then Dan, my husband, he comes up a lot in like, Error averted. Um, but if he, one thing I wanted to do at the beginning, when I first started writing online, um, and my I had a book proposal at the time, but my agent suggested that I work on my platform. So I was like, I'll start a blog. Um, I wanted to put all of my social media uh, under Evolving in Monkey Town, because that was going to be the title of my first book. And I thought, well, great, I'll just do my branding around Monkey Town. You know, we can have some fun with monkeys and blah, 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 blah. Um, but Dan very wisely said, well, Rachel, this isn't going to be your only book because he always, always believes in me. You know, this isn't going to be your own, only book and this isn't your only project. Why don't you just do everything your name, Rachel Held Evans. Um, it's pretty memorable and um, just do it all that. So Twitter handle, Facebook, blog was Rachel Held went from Evolving in Monkey Town or Monkey Town something to rachelheldevans.com and we did everything just my name and it was such a good decision. Like I feel like it was a major mistake that we averted and I see a lot of writers making this mistake. They build their brand around their first project but like if you really believe that you want to do this for a living like you're gonna have more than one project and you're gonna your interests are gonna change and your life is gonna change. I wasn't a mother. I was like I was a completely different person when I first started. Uh, and so I think one of the mistakes that we averted was building a brand around a single topic 
instead of just around me and so that it would be more versatile. Uh, and I know a lot of my writer friends had to go back and change their Twitter handle, change their Facebook, change their blog, and it messed with their SEO and all that because they had to shift when their, um, when their, their projects shifted. Um, and it also like that book, the Evolving in Monkey Town ended up getting retitled anyway to Faith Unraveled because nobody got the Monkey Town reference. I'm from Dayton, Tennessee, Scopes Monkey Trial. So it's really good. I didn't build my brand around that. So that's one mistake that we averted. Um, I, and then some other things that I think I would do differently. Um, I think the whole like trying to take on everybody's baggage sort of like I got sometimes maybe too connected to my readers in the sense that I um, felt like it was my job to help all of them uh, and I felt like a lot of my identity was wrapped up in what they thought of me um, and as the platform grew and as you start to take stands on certain issues or as you know things happen you start to see that the readers will turn on you and if you're too wrapped up and what they think about you, um, it's gonna make it a lot harder. So some of the, the better uh, experiences I've had have actually been very difficult experiences that reminded me um, that I can't get too wrapped up in what my readers think of me. And, but the thing is, like, my readership continues to grow. So, it, and I think it's because I'm honest with people uh, and I don't, I'm not trying to force agreement, but I'll always tell them the truth, so um, yeah. So um, in terms of the, all the various communication channels and tools that we have at our disposal these days, um, you know, blog, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, email, yada, yada, yada. Uh, I know you're active on some of those and not as active on others. Can you just talk a little bit about why you've chosen the channels that you have to prioritize and not the others? Yeah, I mean, I think... I have the blog is probably the most important space for me in the sense that that's where I get to kind of write whatever I want to write and um, I own it. Zuckerberg doesn't own it. And um, so that's, that's the place I want to cultivate and, and put my best material. Um, but the thing is Facebook has become for better or worse, kind of the place to be. Um, and a lot, we writers, when we get together and we've had a few beers, we talk about this because it's um, it's a little, when I look at where the traffic to my blog is coming from, when I look at my Google Analytics, it's, it's so much of it is coming from Facebook. Getting the Facebook shares is like we'll make or break a, a post uh, to get the word out about, you know, your thoughts on a certain matter. So. You know, Facebook, it's important, I think, to be active on Facebook, and a lot of writers are using it really skillfully. I mean, you look at, like, Elizabeth Gilbert and people like that who have massive Facebook followings, and they'll put little sort of vignettes on Facebook um, and get quite a bit of shares uh, from there. So I think it's pretty important to cultivate a page on Facebook, and how you use that is up to you. I tend to use it um, less for sharing lengthy posts, um, though I do a little bit of that, and more for sharing articles that I like, um, and just quick little shout outs for things, um, particularly elevating other writers and speakers that I think need to be heard. Um, that's kind of how I like to use that space. Um, and then pointing people to my blog posts. Um, but yeah, having a Facebook page I think is pretty important right now. Um, whether or not that's good for humanity, it's a whole other <laughs> issue. And then I'm also on Twitter, and I don't know that Twitter helps me that much, but I have a lot of followers, and I'm addicted to it, and it brings out the worst in me. Um, but those are the three that I use the most, my blog, Facebook, and Twitter. And, um, yeah, so, and I usually, I use Twitter, well, I use Twitter for sharing articles and for making snarky comments and, um Sometimes for good, sometimes for good, but <laughs> mostly for just having a presence out there. Uh, but I'd say Facebook and my blog are my two most important tools. So another topic um, that's kind of separate from what we've been discussing tonight, but it's been a topic of conversation on many of our other webinars, which is around self-publishing. Um, mm -hmm. Have you got any thoughts on you know how much you've considered that? If you were, again, starting over again, <clears throat> is that something you'd think of more strongly or, hmm. or not? Maybe if I had to do it over again, I would. I don't know. I, I've had 
an excellent experience in traditional publishing. And that's not true for everybody, but I've had a really, really good experience. I have a great agent, Rochelle Gardner, and I have a great, um, I've had great publishers uh, who've been supportive. Right now I'm with uh, Thomas Nelson uh, for the last book and the next book. And um, and so I've, I've had a good experience and I think that I have have benefited from what uh, traditional publishing offers in the way of marketing quite a bit. Um, Thomas Nelson has a great uh, department that's focused on marketing and, and they have a couple people in that department who focus on social media and they're really smart at that. They're really, really good at it. And it's something I'm already pretty tapped into. And so when we get to working together, we brainstorm all these ideas about a book launch and having, you know, um, uh, a Facebook page where you have supporters who want to help you promote your book on there. Like there's a lot of great opportunities to use social media. Uh, and there, my publisher is completely on board with that. So um, I've had a good experience with that. Something I would consider now though, is possibly at some point self publishing like an ebook um, more instructional or something um, in addition to uh, traditional publishing. Um, but you know, to each his own, but I've had a good experience and I think it's, it's worth, uh, for a lot of people, it's worth getting the help that you get, um, from uh, a traditional publisher. You're not, you get experts, you get editors, you get marketing teams, you get, you know, designers, um, you you have access to this wealth of, of people, um, who can help you. But I definitely think that self-publishing is a good option as well. And I might do it in the future um, in addition to publishing traditionally. So we have a really great question from Kendall about navigating the tension between conservative and progressive theological backgrounds. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's something you've had a fair amount of uh, experience in. Yes, I'm reading her comment right now. Hmm. Hmm. Yes. Oh gosh, this is such a struggle. Yeah. <laughs> yes, the tension of saving communities is yes, 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 yes. This is so hard. And and I think that the the, the question is really like when do you push outside, you know, and, and speak a truth that might be controversial in your circles? When do you take a more pastoral approach? knowing your readers or knowing your for pastors it's often knowing their congregation so like maybe a pastor thinks um ha, you know has a conviction on a, a controversial theological or political issue but they know that their congregation is uh, not there with them yet not at least not all the way um a lot of pastors have to navigate that and i have nothing but respect for the grace and wisdom and care with which they do that um i think it comes down to knowing your audience and knowing yourself um and then always pushing just a little further than you're comfortable with and that they might be comfortable with just a little not a lot just a little just pushing just a little bit over uh can be a good strategy like i tell myself well if i'm feeling a little uncomfortable then i'm probably doing it right um uh, but it's really tricky. I, I think, and I think in this environment, I feel like right now, and everybody all knows what we're all talking about, but culturally we're in just such a tumultuous time. It's, I am constantly tempted to be my very worst self and to, to justify everything I say because, you know, truth, resistance. Um, when there are areas in which I think I could actually, if I would slow down a little bit and not get too ahead of myself, I could actually make change. Because you're not going to change people's minds by yelling. You're, you're at, I hate to say it because I do not behave as, this, as though this is true. I do not. But I don't actually think Twitter changes many people's minds. But a thoughtful, well-crafted, well-researched blog post or article or book just might. So for instance, um, this is a super thorny issue, but like abortion. Um, my tweets about the abortion issue are probably not going to change any hearts and minds or make people think about that issue in a different way. But a blog post in which I talk to various people on various sides, in which I explore the issues from, from several different angles, in which I honestly share my own experiences wrestling with this and, and seeing that it, things weren't as black and white as I once thought. Like that, I've heard from people 
have has actually changed their minds. <laughs> I've never had anybody tweet me back and say, hey, that tweet completely changed my view on things. <laughs> but I have had people leave comments and say, I never thought about it this way. I've changed my mind. So I guess it's a matter of knowing yourself, knowing your audience, and knowing your medium. The medium of Twitter and Facebook, there's just they're just not as conducive, I think, as like a more long form piece to actually getting into the, all the shades of an issue. Because I mean, writers, we know like 140 characters can be great for wit and and for a, a, a zinger, but we know that that some things are not as black and white as 140 characters and need a little more fleshing out. So uh, the, the thing is, it's just, it's Kendall, it's just, it's different for everybody and it's so hard. And the fact that you care about doing it right means like you're on your way because a lot of people don't, or a lot of people, we get so convicted that we don't care about expressing those convictions with care. Um, but I think that if you if you know where your audience is and you push them just a little bit, um, that that might be a wise way to, to handle it. But good luck, and let me know how it goes. <laughs> so Rachel, I know that so many people um, are looking forward to your next book whenever that uh, ends up coming out. Oh yes, um, <laughs> me too. <laughs> <and> so, <laughs> I, I'm sure you know. There's only so much that you can say about it at this point, yeah. but um, you know, would you like to share a little bit with us? Oh my gosh, I am. Um, I'm a little late in turning this one in. Uh, my editor has been so gracious, uh, but I mean, a lot happened. I had a baby, and um, so I'm. I won't tell you how late I am because I don't want to set people's expectations to think that I can get away with that um, on a regular basis. But um, I'm running a little late on this project, but it's a book. The next book is about the Bible. And it's it's about what I wanted to do is kind of address uh, the various genres of scripture and talk about how they, how they, how we can connect our own stories to the stories of scripture. So, you know, I talk about origin stories and the function that they play in the ancient Near Eastern culture in which Genesis emerged, and the function that origin stories play in our lives um, today as a way of saying that the Bible uh, remains relevant and deeply impactful, even when you consider it from its original context. Um, that you can say of scripture, that was written in an ancient Near Eastern culture to people in places that are very unlike our own many thousands of years ago, but it still matters to us today and here's why. Uh, and so I'm playing around with every other chapter. I do um, a creative retelling of a familiar Bible story. So I'm doing a little bit of fiction, um, you know, some, some dialogue and some poetry and, uh, and so that's been really fun. It's definitely stretching me. This, is, this was a lot to bite off. Um, but I'm glad I did. It's a challenge and I'm learning a ton. I'm doing all kinds of research. I'm quoting Walter Brueggemann like there's no tomorrow. And it's been great. I, I've really, really, I love my favorite kind of book to write is the kind of book where I learn a lot of stuff while I'm writing it. And so I hope that it all translates to the reader that I've had a ball with this one. So is there any release date set for that yet? <laughs> tell us about I'm sorry. Not? Well, um, no, we do not have a release date yet. Okay, I, um, no problem. I don't I want to push it. I through this book, Brian, and it, and I, I, I told my editors I'd send it in in April. Oh, <laughs> you're making me stressed out. So, um, Rachel also does a lot of speaking, and <clears throat> I'll be privileged enough to work with her on three speaking events, in in person speaking events, this coming year. So I want to just mention those briefly. The first will be at Holland, Michigan in May at the Writing for Your Life Writers Workshop with uh, Western Theological Seminary and Hope College. Um, the second event <clears throat> will be in July at Belmont University in Nashville. Again, that's uh, another Writing for Your Life um, conference. And um, you can subscribe to our email list or find out about more more about those events um, on our Facebook or, or website. Um, and then the third will be a Frederick Beekner Writers Workshop at Fuller Seminary in September. Um, I think it's the 12th through the 15th of September. 
and uh, <clears throat> registration and information is not available for that yet, but um, stay tuned, and um, that will be coming out soon. So, um, Rachel, are, are there any other speaking events, maybe some nearer-term ones that you'd like to um, oh, share with people? I'm sure there are, and I'm sure I won't remember the dates, but if you go to my website, uh, my schedule is up. I'll be in North Carolina here pretty soon at um, uh, the Canuga Conference Center for the Episcopal Church and then Lee McRae College in Banner Elk. And before that, I'll be this week, I'll be in Leewood, Kansas uh, at uh, a women's conference there. And I, I, with the one year old, I don't really think much further than two weeks out. So let me ask Gandalf. Hold on. Let's see what Gandalf says. <laughs> hey, Gandalf. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there he is. <laughs> What's on my speaking schedule next, Gandalf? <laughs> So, so You're going just to, to Middle Earth in July. So just to finish off, um, since you mentioned your son, how is he doing now that he's a year old? Oh, he's great. He's very active. He started walking at nine months. So we've been just, he's, he's just, he's like small, but strong. So he's smaller than most kids his age, but he's really, really fast and really, really strong. And I, I don't know what we're going to do if he's an athlete because Dan and I are not. We're gonna like have nothing to talk about with the parents. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be all like, we're gonna we're gonna be we're older parents too, so we're gonna be old. We'll be making like friends and Seinfeld references, and they're gonna be like, we don't get it. Anyway, so it's it's great, hardest best year of our lives. Um, he just celebrated his first birthday uh, two days ago, um, and that's not his actual birthday. That's when we celebrated. His actual birthday is day after tomorrow. So we're just super blessed to have him. His name's Henry, and he's a year old, and he's great. Well, Rachel, thank you so much for spending time with us this evening. We greatly appreciate it. Uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I think all of your insight, experience, wisdom will be really useful for everyone uh, that uh, that hears you. So thanks again. Well, thanks, Brian. It's good to be here. Bye, everybody. Bye, Kendall. <laughs>